Okay, and so you end up at Cambridge. Um, can you tell us a little bit about just generally uh, your time there, postgraduate studies, and particularly um, the religious environment at Cambridge? Yes, um, I had two spells there in Cambridge. Uh, the first one was from 1979 to 81, um, two academic years, and the other one was 89. Um, and uh, to some extent, uh, uh, the atmosphere, the environment had changed considerably mm. um, by the, uh, the second time I'd come there, so from, from the beginnings of the 80s to the end of the 80s. Um, but to begin with, you know, I was there uh, 1979, uh, um, and um, it was probably in its heyday. Uh, in every way, it's a student's paradise. And if, if, you, th if you think of uh, an institution that is geared towards people who want to learn, this is it. Uh, uh, it has it, it had classical curriculum theologically it, and across right across the board mm. um, the new changes hadn't occurred yet there was intellectual rigor um, there was a requirement for clear expression so uh, one of the things that was hammered into us as students postgraduate students was to write plain English to avoid technical terminology at all costs mm -hmm. if you can't say it clearly uh, and simply, then uh, you haven't shown that you've understood something. So the importance of rigorous logic, clear expression, uh, good methodology, and respect for tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, probably without realising it, one of the most decisive uh, things for me spiritually was my involvement with Westfield House, which is a, a little Lutheran seminary attached to the university. Mm -hmm. uh, the preceptor, the head of that was Ron Feuerhahn. Um, and there were quite a number, not just of English students, but international students, mainly Americans and Canadians, but also students from all over the world. Uh, in the second time we were there, the international flavour had changed. But uh, the time with Ron Feuerhahn um, uh, proved to be very, very fruitful and we didn't know at the time just how important that relationship was. Were there any other particular uh, spiritual influences that you came across there? I'm particularly thinking again of this, this um, you know, boy from the Barossa who finds himself in Cambridge. and The centre uh, of the academic world, as <laughs> right. it were. You know, mm. That's as high as you mm. can go academically mm. in the English-speaking world. Yeah, and to some extent it was daunting. Uh, uh, and I'm pleased that I didn't go there immediately after university mm -hmm. or seminary, mm -hmm. uh, that I had some confidence in my own ability to think and work things out for myself. I was older, more mature. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, if I can just say, you know, uh, Cambridge did some things very well. And the best part of it was that as a uh, student, I had to prepare a paper for my tutor every fortnight. So I'd write a paper, he'd read it, and then we'd spend an hour together. I wouldn't read it to him, he'd read it, and he would then interrogate me mm -hmm. on the paper. Uh, and we covered, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, if it's once a fortnight, you cover quite a few topics in that, that space of time. Uh, so besides the lectures, and preparing for the lectures and besides the thesis, this was the focus. Uh, and that it did very, very well. So you had your own guided reading and you, you, very often the lecturer didn't tell you what topic to do, but says here, here are a range of topics which you'll be examined on. Um, pick and choose the, the one you want to do. So I could choose a whole lot of topics and I tended to do more theological ones other students would do more uh, historical and uh, technical topics, background, uh, cultural topics. But in terms of biblical studies, uh, the biggest gap was that there was no exegesis. Hmm. 
So for example, uh, I still remember doing a course on Psalm 1, Psalms 1 to 20 or 30, I think it's 1 to 30, by the head of the Old Testament department, a, a rather dry as a bones um, intellectual. Uh, we did just linguistic work. I see. Uh, there was no interest in what it means, meant or in, as the word of God or no analysis of the text in what we call exegesis. So there was just no exegesis. So when no. you say mainly linguistic work, what, what would that look like? Well, just to translate mm -hmm. and to be able to comment on uh, difficulties in the text. So textual criticism, technical, things technical and, mm. linguistic data. Mm and particularly difficult expressions. And then uh, you'd have to use all the array of uh, scholastic techniques to work out the exact sense of difficult expressions. Mm. Right? So difficulties in pinning down the sense of the text. But once you'd done that, there was no attempt to... Job done. It was mm. the job done. Mm. It's groundwork. And the idea was, and it's not bad, mm. Uh, mm. it's the foundation of everything, the idea was that, yes, auto, uh, uh, students would automatically then be able to read the text for themselves, exegete the text. But coming from the Lutheran tradition and the continental German tradition, um, uh, realised that uh, uh, the biggest difficulty uh, in, uh, in, in, in reading a text was not so much in pinning down its sense, but analysing it. And, and not just analysing it technically, but analysing it theologically mm -hmm. and uh, working out how that text applies then in the life of the church. Um, so it, it completely bypassed that. So that was very weak. Uh, uh, the dominant influence was Anglican uh, and low church evangelical Anglican, but uh, being in the Old Testament was twinned with the Semitic department quite a number of my lecturers were Jews yeah. and I was introduced then to uh, the whole Jewish tradition mm. and that was really marvellous mm. to be confronted by top level Jewish scholars mm. uh, of the Old Testament. Um, but uh, when I started there it was still um, fairly sound. You know, all the my lecturers were practicing Christians. Right. Um, uh, most of them were very liberal, but in a very tolerant kind of way. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the Cambridge tradition. So we had the professor was a very liberal guy, but he would then super, supervise students, uh, PhD students from the US who were basically fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. And uh, people didn't see that there was any problem with that. What was required was, uh, 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 if you like, methodological uh, soundness. So as long as that student uh, outlined what his presuppositions was and that, that he unfolded his argument in a sound methodological way, even if the his uh, supervisor disagreed with his conclusions, mm. he would get good results. Yep. No? Yeah. It was not on um, uh, inculcating a certain point of view, but a sound methodology. Mm. What a gift. Uh, oh, yeah. What a gift, yes. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time I was there. But things had begun to change in 89 when I went back to do the doctorate. Mm. Interesting. Uh, well, they were a bit making years because you have the beginnings of the feminist movement and the counterculture had reached its peak. Mm -hmm. And there were the, the rumblings right across the uh, um, uh, whole culture but academic world of what's now called postmodernism. Yeah. And uh, you then had the influence of uh, sociological approaches, not just historical background, cultural approaches, but sociology was coming in and, and really big feminism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, you know some of the pioneering feminist theologians uh, were in Oxford and Cambridge at that particular time and were very, very, very influential. And the uh, uh, basic 
uh, tone uh, of the place was universalist. You know, there's, you respect all, uh, not just all denominations, uh, Christian denominations and all Christian points of view, but you respect all religious people, no matter what their uh, religious commitment is. Mm. So with, and what was lying behind that was uh, basically universalism. Uh, there's all sorts of things that had prepared for this. Mm. But the notion that uh, there are many roads to God and um, all of us basically have our own opinions about God. Mm. Now, that was becoming very, very strong uh, in uh, 89. And partly the reason for that was the... Uh, uh, there were many reasons, but within the church there was a loss of confidence in uh, the classical confessions. You know, the Anglicans who no longer held the classical Anglican teaching. Mm. Uh, evangelicals who were uneasy about their tradition, Baptists, um, Presbyterians, Lutherans even. Uh, and um, behind that was the... Uh, lack of confidence in Scripture and the authority of Scripture. So Scripture had, even though in you know in Old Testament and New Testament those areas you studied the Scripture, uh, but you did so not to uh, because you were convinced that it was the Word of God or even taught uh, religious truth. But uh, you studied it from a sociological mm. or a feminist or a comparative religion or a cultural point of view mm. or a literary point of view. Mm. Yeah, there's two things sort of that come coming out of that personally, quite apart from that whole uh, what I gained academically. Uh, the first one was uh, uh, a good conviction about the importance of the Word of God. Yep. In contrast, to, in what contrast mm. to that, mm. and um, and that the Bible is the Word of God, and uh, what that means then for our lives, and uh, that it doesn't just communicate cognitive text, but it is living and powerful. Mm. Um, the important thing is not so much what it means, but what it does, yep. uh, and its use in the church. So. Uh, it was particularly, and oh, that wasn't quite so clear uh, at the end of my master's studies, coming back in, in 81, but at the end of 89, I come back, came back and basically uh, resolved that over against that a belittling and embarrassment with the Bible, I would only from that point on teach whatever I had to teach biblically. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've managed to do that since, mm. partly because um, I also was able to see that the one thing that was perennial, that lasted, was the teaching and practice that was biblical. Yeah. Everything else uh, uh, came yeah. and went uh, with fashions. Um, and that the only way we could counter the universalism and... Uh, feminism and the secularism that was becoming increasingly dominant was by uh, emphasising the proper use of the Word of God and its liturgical use. Mm, mm. Uh, so that's, that, that was the one thing I came out of that uh, second period. But the seeds for that were there already yeah. early. Uh, and they go back further than that. Uh, and the realisation connection with that, what was important was not uh, thinking theologically, but the formation of the conscience, that God's yeah. word was addressed as law and gospel to conscience. Mm. Mm. And you get away from that and you lose everything. It, it makes me think of a, a parallel in when you were talking earlier about um, your marriage and family, how you, you know these things intellectually, but then you actually have an experience which somehow yeah. confirms and solidifies yeah. them in a new way. Like, yes. of course, you always held that Scripture was the Word of God yeah. Yeah. and all of this, but then you see the contrast and what it's actually doing to people, yeah. and this somehow sank in and the penny dropped at a deeper level for you. Yeah, and I mm. saw on a personal level what would happen to those uh, fellow students who gave up mm. confidence in Scripture, what a mess their lives became. Right. Um, 
Yeah, and also what uh, had led to that was that well, there was something that was disturbing me, was that uh, even those who were you know, so-called conservatives or confessional, um, say in pastors' conferences and discussions, would argue from experience or sociology or uh, uh, analogy, uh, uh, but particularly from experience and uh, statistics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but people were not didn't start off and say with the first question is what does the Bible teach on this as foundational mm-hmm. uh, experience tradition other things were the the fallback positions in argument mm. now closely allied to this was and this goes to your point about my own upbringing and background was uh, the uh, growing secularization, not just of the church, but of the whole of our society. And I still remember a time, this was just before I went to Cambridge the second time to do my doctorate. Uh, I had was visiting New Guinea and came, met with a former student of mine who uh, had come to Adelaide to learn Hebrew and spent some time here, and then went and did um, uh, his master's degree in a Lutheran seminary in America, unnamed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, he came back and he was teaching at Martin... We well, started teaching at Martin Luther Seminary. Or, no, he was teaching at Martin Luther Seminary then. A person by the name of Emma Zanki Munop, a lovely man. But I asked him, he, this, I met him, he'd just come back from the US after completing his master's there. And I said, how did it go? And he was a fairly ebullient kind of person. And I was struck because he paused and reflected for a long time before he spoke. And he said, John, for them, nothing is sacred any longer. That was his summary of the seminary Lutheranism in North America Mm. and the West. Nothing is sacred any longer. And that kind of articulated uh, something that had been bothering me. One of the papers I did when I did my master's in, uh, when was it, Uh, uh, 79 to 81, was a um, paper on holiness in the uh, priestly literature of the Pentateuch. Because uh, if there's one thing that theology of that my day, my generation, could make no sense of whatsoever, was the teaching on holiness. Mm. Uh, holiness was just basically being separated from God or belonging to God, but, uh, or uh, morality but just what holiness was and its importance in uh, the Christian life and across all Christian denominations ecumenically had been lost. Uh, And so coming out of that, and uh, this was very important then too for the doctorate that I did, the thesis, which is uh, the, uh, the basis, function and significance of choral music and chronicles. Mm -hmm which has to do with the place of psalm singing and uh, to musical accompaniment in the divine service at the temple in Jerusalem uh, and in Chronicles. Now, to make sense of that, you had to make sense of holiness. And that kind of gelled that together. Mm. And nothing's been the same since, right. theologically. Just an understanding of holiness and its importance. And the fact that we share God's holiness. Um, now, coming out of that hippie generation, we, I was, uh, my generation was very careless uh, with what we used to do in church. Um, now, we weren't terribly fussed about the altar and the sanctuary. But I remember one occasion in which, this was up at St Peter's in Rapilli, uh, I was involved with a, a, a chapel group that did a liturgical drama as part of chapel. 
And as part of that, the students, and I allowed the students to use the altar as a um, prop for their enactment. And I can still see I had a delegation of about four or five students who came to me utterly uh, perplexed and angry <laughs> that I had allowed the altar to be desecrated. Uh, now, I thought I was in the right at that time, but, uh, well, I did, it didn't happen again, and I could see, if it, even if it was just for, out of pastoral tact, mm. but it triggered a long process of reflection mm. about the importance of holiness and respecting what's holy and not uh, acting in a way that's sacrilegious or desecrates God's holiness. Mm. And so moving back then from Cambridge to Australia, um, you, you, you had gone from active pastoral ministry, let's say, before Cambridge, and then from Cambridge, was it to Luther Seminary as a lecturer then? Not immediately. I, I uh, spent some time here in Glenelg. Um, oh, it was nearly a year. Uh, and then I was called to the seminary. Yep. And so that was the beginning of 82. And then so... Uh, then 82 to uh, 88 was the first spell there, then 89, Cambridge doing the doctorate, and then from 18, uh, 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 90 onwards. Yeah. And so in the big picture of um, time at uh, Luther Seminary, which then became Australian Lutheran College, what, yep. were the, what were the joys and challenges of that time and, and the, the surprises along the way? Okay, uh, there's so many things. Uh, uh, what was, uh, there were a lot of things that I expected and were there. You know, the collegiality, the, um, uh, the joy of uh, interacting with students mm. theologically. But the unexpected surprise was uh, the sheer enjoyment that I found in um, uh, pastoral care of students. So was there a sense that you were leaving that behind when you went there, but actually it wasn't the case at all? Yeah, uh, mm. that, that, uh, it was a very important part of my previous ministry, mm. Mm. and even of my time in Cambridge, mm. uh, pastoral care of people. Uh, but uh, then realising that my pastoral care of my students was more important than the teaching that I did. In fact, that was the most fundamental teaching. Right. So that was a surprise. Mm. Um, uh, I knew, I mean, I always had the conviction of the importance of this. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, to see that, that how easy it was to do, really, and how uh, responsive students were to that caring, and how important that was then in that formation of students that I was talking about. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that was the first surprise, and I'd say the greatest joy. And, um, yeah... Um, it wasn't all unalloyed joy because many students... <laughs> uh, Present company excluded, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, didn't, I didn't get on with them and they didn't get on with me, mm. but well, that's just the way we are. Mm. Uh, Was there a part of that? I'm curious, you know, you've obviously been in a lot of different seminary contexts yes. around the world. Is there a part of there that part of that, that was easier at Luther Seminary ALC because of its smaller size, do you think? Or? Yes, and, mm. and it was something I saw in Westfield House because of its mm. size. Um, it, there were two factors, at, uh, or three factors. One, one is just size. The second factor is that at least when I came there initially, all, almost all students lived on cam campus. Yeah. And there was a very strong, vibrant community, and many of them were single. Uh, but living on campus and community life. So there was community formation. Um, but also then it was uh, something that was encouraged, even though um, uh, not all lecturers were equally good at it, nobody objected to it. Hmm. And uh, those who were in a position of leadership, from Henry Harmon onwards, who was my first boss, uh, and supremely Vic Fitzner, uh, encouraged it and practised it. And th there was a recognition. 
I don't know if it was ever clearly articulated at the time about the importance of it. But at that same time, for example, you had care groups coming in mm. and all those things that you would be familiar with. That I was, you know, at the time which when that was new. And we don't realise, in terms of what happens around the world, how unique and precious that is. Mm. Um, that's something special. Uh, uh, that I would hate to see lost. Um, the second great joy of that time was to be able to immerse myself every day in the whole of the Bible. You know, I taught the Bible. And uh, not just some parts of it, because I had Bible introduction, which you know is an introductory course, for first year, beginning with Genesis, ending with Revelation. Mm. So teaching the whole of the Bible. Um, but then in all the study that I did and the other teaching was to be able to focus not just on some parts of the Bible. What you do as a pastor is bits and pieces. Mm. You prepare for this sermon, this Bible study, this com confirmation lesson. Uh, bits and pieces. And it means that there's whole parts of the Bible that you basically have to overlook or neglect. Uh, the, that great joy was... Um, uh, being able to immerse myself on the whole of Scripture and to discover unexpected things from the whole of Scripture. Mm. So parts of the Bible which previously hadn't really turned me on in any way or interested me uh, became more and more precious to me. Um, so, for example, the book of Hebrews, which was closed to me mm. until I came to seminary. And I think the first inklings of it when I had to teach in Bible introduction. Um, but uh, uh, that's proved and consequently to be very, very important to me. So the whole of Scripture. The third unexpected joy okay, from cross-cultural communication. We not only had many more foreign students in uh, ALC, Luther Seminary was at that stage, uh, than now, so overseas students. Particularly uh, Southeast Asia. Asia, or, but yeah. also American, mm -hmm. Canadian. Um, yeah, I don't need to go back to... It was, it was quite a number from all over the place, but mainly Southeast Asia. Uh, so there was that cross-cultural communication uh, uh, with the students that were there, many of them doing postgraduate study and some that I'd supervised uh, in some way. But then um, uh, doing... Um, the teaching of uh, uh, across cultures. And this happened in two basic ways. The first one was, and the most decisive one was, as a seminary lecturer to do uh, uh, the training of pastors and evangelists, Aboriginal pastors and evangelists in Central Australia. And you had to do that in, it's an oral culture, so you do it in the Old, Old Testament way, which is the wisdom way, which is... Uh, Oral, mm. uh, and uh, the joy of that, and to see the way God's word could jump across language, cultural, social, political barriers, right, and move people, touch people deeply, and it was obvious. And for those who aren't familiar with what, what these sorts of things that happen in our church, when you say Aboriginal pastors and evangelists in Central Australia. You literally mean going to Central Australia. Yeah. Other students would come to to Adelaide for their it's, studies from wherever they are, yeah. but in this case, lecturers would go to them, s sit in the bush, and yeah. this sort of thing. I still remember my first time was just outside of Hermansburg. No, this is a Luther training Lutheran pastors evangelists. They don't go to seminary in Adelaide or elsewhere for all sorts of practical reasons. Well, they mm. they are um, uh, done, if you like, on site mm. training. And in um, uh, periods of about uh, four or five days, spells. So they'd come together and somebody would teach for that. And so I still remember the first course I taught was on Genesis. And it was a time when land rights was big. So I started off with Abraham and the gift of the land. Uh, basically stories of Abraham and the land. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know... Uh, then just unpacking that. But then what would happen would be that uh, we would read, say, uh, 
Genesis 12, 1 to 2, the call of Abraham. Um, I'd read it in English. It would be read in the local, from the, their translations, the local languages, not just one, but at least two or three other languages. Then I would comment on it just in a slab that would be translated at least in two languages. And then there'll be questions, discussion on that. And then you'd have the next slab, mm -hmm. uh, questions, discussions, reactions. And so you work through slowly. Uh, and one of the surprising things that happened already that first time, uh, you now it suits my style of teaching, you know, mm -hmm. that interaction uh, and that oral way of doing things, was that I realised that I was, from the reactions and questions, I was learning more than I was teaching. And that they were far closer to this material than I was. Yep. And definitely than my students were. And I can look back to each one of the times that I spent in Central Australia in that cross-cultural teaching as uh, peak times for me mm. as a seminary lecturer. Mm. And each of them is distinguished in some way by something special. Uh, the last one I did was just a couple of years ago on the Psalms. Uh, amazing, amazing time. Uh, so it was cross-cultural teaching uh, of the Bible. And I realised then... Um, that uh, 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 if you taught sort of generally, let's say one time, for example, I'd go and teach about worship, but instead of teaching about worship generally, I'd look at particular passages that taught worship. Yeah. So to teach from the Bible, if you taught from the Bible, then it worked. Yep. Get away from the Bible, it doesn't work. Mm. You can't jump across those cultures uh, because you're tangled up in Western ideas. Mm. Uh, the... Uh, so it was in Central Australia and then in Southeast Asia, particularly in Malaysia, with uh, Lutheran, Lutherans of Indian background and Lutherans of Chinese background. Uh, but then elsewhere too. I've done it in uh, India, mm. New Guinea, South Africa. Uh, so, and that, it's, it's that enrichment that comes from teaching the Word of God across cultures, and how each culture, um, God's design, each culture that they can have access to some part of Scripture in a way that others can't. Mm. And that has been, for me, a immense enrichment. Mm. And largely unexpected, I imagine, when totally, you Totally, came... utterly unexpected, yeah. because I foresaw only difficulties, you know, being intellectual and academic, how can you communicate these Western ideas to Stone Age people? <laughs> now, that, arro yeah, that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. arrogance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and understanding the sophistication of their spiritual understanding, mm, mm, mm. but in their own terms. Yes. Um, and in Central Australia, did you sleep in the swag or did they find you a nice, hut, a nice little cabin somewhere? <laughs> no, I swept in a I slept in a swag, uh, <laughs> but in a tent. Oh, very good. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, at least I had that, mer that, that mercy. <laughs> uh, yes, there, there, there's so many things that happened mm, there. Mm. Uh, it wasn't quite as primitive in South Africa and in Malaysia and Singapore, where I've also mm. done that kind of teaching. Mm, mm. And in those years, uh, your, your teaching career at Luther Seminary and, and ALC, you're also... Um, uh, involved in the ch in the wider church in all sorts of ways and the commission on theology and 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 all that sort of thing and and um, most people who who know our church scene know that you've been involved in some quite uh, difficult church debates over those years to say the least and you've been prominently involved in those um, and and again if people know our scene and they know you they know where you stand on various things and they can go and look it up on the internet if they yeah. don't. I'm interested particularly today to ask, during those times, how this affected you personally, uh, what influence these sorts of struggles in our own church had on, on your faith? Yes, they, they, they've been the most trying times. And I learned a lot about spiritual warfare as a result of it. The two big controversies that I've been centre stage with is uh, the first one, which is maybe not so well known now anymore, was the whole issue of worship um, and controversies about worship. 
worship styles or everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, the whole debate about traditional contemporary worship, um, which are silly terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and that despite the fact that I was one of the leaders initially in introducing some of the new hymnody and uh, some liturgical flexibility, but uh, basically <coughs> an understanding of worship not just as our response to God, but as divine service, God serving us um, and everything that that entails. Mm. Now, um, uh, now, I got something of a reputation as being a sort of uh, uh, liturgical Nazi mm -hmm. uh, and inflexible and out of touch as a result of that. And some hurt, very hurtful things were said and done as mm. a result of that. But that was merely a trial run for the big one, which was the ordination of women. Uh, but behind the ordination of women, there's a whole question of scripture. Uh, now, as a result of that then, uh, received immense amount of abuse. And not just me, but it's affected my family. Not mm. so much the children, we tried to shield them, but it's affected Claire. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, and so and and a lot of it was very personal. So, uh, a lot of my uh, people who I was very close to, as a result of this, uh, have become alienated from me. Mm. Uh, not by any choice of mine, or I hope not from the way I treated them, because I always try to make a point of um, treating them as brothers and sisters in Christ. But because I was regarded as enemy. Mm -hmm. Uh, right? and uh, culminated in charges of heresy being issued against me. Uh, that was the most hurtful. Now, um, uh, I don't want to dwell on that because uh, compared to many others, I've had somewhat of a charmed life, <laughs> protected. Uh, but th that's the part that's hurt me most. Um, there's, uh, yeah, there's a number of things that come out of that. And mm. good things. First of all, uh, um, it, it's made me aware of the limits of discussion and debate. Hmm. Um, you know, you can discuss until the cows come home and debate until the cows come home. But if you get people who are uh, uh, with two different mentalities or things, uh, debate and discussion merely consolidates differences. So let's say, for example, you are gung-ho for ordaining women, I'm gung-ho for preventing that. The more I debate with you, the more you sharpen your arguments. Mm. And the more I attack you, the more you defend yourself, the more adamant you become. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 there's a limit to that. I'm not arguing against discussion and debate, mm -hmm. but there's mm -hmm. this realisation of the limits of discussion and debate. Um, it became clear to me that most people didn't want to hear uh, the arguments in favour of the traditional position and didn't want to know why I held this position. They mm. just wanted to assert their own position. No, mm. that's just human nature. Mm. Uh, and, if, and if anything, that's gotten, again, worse rather than better in our circles, the polarisation. The polarisation, mm. and it hasn't been aided by the Twitter culture. Right. Because you... you it's, Twitter is polarising. You like or you don't like. Mm -hmm. uh, you're either friend or enemy. There's no nuancing. Yep. Uh, uh, no, there are not two sides on the no. worship war. There's no two sides on the question of ordination women. There's not two sides on the question of uh, the subordination of wives to husbands or any of these things. Uh, there's a spectrum. Yep. Uh, and different people hold it in a different way or for different reasons. Uh, and it'll, it's always the devil who wants to put people into boxes and get us to treat each other as enemy. And so that, and so that discovery of that limitation of debate and discussion then, did that... Uh, I mean, you, you continue to be involved in debates and discussions mm -hmm. the whole way through, yeah. for, as far as I can tell, but did it, did it change your approach practically then, or did you, well, how did it you know, change the way you, will, you conduct yourselves within these things? I think there's three things that, or oh, four things, um, 
The first thing is uh, the importance of exercising a hermeneutic of appreciation. Uh, before, you criti before I criticise somebody else, just finding out what their exact position is and uh, standing in their shoes, understanding why they held that position. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the importance of symp sympathetic hearing, listening, and not to presume you know but, uh, uh, what the other person thinks and feels and where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my aim was then, in that whole debate on the ordination women, was to be able to uh, articulate a case for the ordination of women which was better than theirs. Mm -hmm. Now, that was just a mental exercise. Mm -hmm. um, if I could do that, then I'd been listening and understanding, mm -hmm. listening with understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and to, together with that, then, the, uh, the need for humility, uh, uh, that you confess your position uh, uh, and you don't have to win arguments. The importance is not winning arguments, but uh, confessing and stating the truth as simply as possible. And if possible, to, uh, uh, to state, uh, to use scripture. So instead of saying, this is my idea, um, uh, this is the way I see it, this is, let's forget about what you and I say, what does God's word say? Now, if God's word sp speaks, then I, then we all need to attend to it. So to stand under the importance of not just theoretically, but practically standing under yeah. God's word. And not just in one area, but across the spectrum. Yeah. So uh, that's the uh, second thing. Um, the, uh, oh, and then in that, then um, to be content just with uh, stating what Scripture says. So uh, uh, instead of me, I found again and again on the question of ordination of women, instead of giving my arguments, and I can give all sorts of arguments, yeah. you know them, yeah. people can look them up, uh, but just saying, Paul says, I have this as a command from the Lord. Mm -hmm. He says it, I believe it. Uh, now what happens then is I won't convince that other people intellectually, but I'm all, but also in a position of humility, uh, I, I'm not asserting my own point of view, but I speak the word of God and it's addressed to the conscience. And um, uh, it can do its work there. Mm -hmm. But it does its work as, on, as it has on me because uh, uh, that's the word that, that uh, changed my mind on the matter. Um, the third thing is to see that in any theological controversy, uh, the theological controversy is merely the front. Behind that is spiritual warfare. Um, Satan stirs up spiritual controversy so uh, that we regard and treat each other as enemy. Mm. Uh, and uh, that we then uh, fall out with each other. And that's the hardest thing for me was at that time is for people, you know, to regard people, and I guess the same applies for people across the other side of the table, mm. um, to regard people uh, that, uh, uh, as my brothers and sisters in Christ, and for them to regard me as brothers and sisters in Christ, and not enemy. We have only one enemy, mm. Satan. And to see that on all sides of any controversy, Satan's going to be at work. Uh, now, I could speak at length about that, but, but uh, uh, that for me was the, is the key discovery and gain from it. Mm. And if it is spiritual warfare, then the matter won't be resolved by argument. It, it can't be resolved politically, mm. because poli politics merely is, is Satan's way. Mm. He's using power, and Satan loves power. Uh, he exercises power. Uh, rather than authority. So uh, if you try and resolve it politically, you make bad worse. But the only way it can be resolved is, first of all, in prayer. 
that might seem rather odd because you'd probably expect me to say with the word of God. But prayer, in spiritual warfare, it's using the word of God in prayer. And that's the only way we can find our way through uh, these and similar controversies. Mm. Uh, so yes, uh, from a human point of view, uh, been more hurt by this than anything else. Mm. Tough times. Tough times. Mm. Um, but strangely, good times. Because I've learnt more mm. about myself. Yep. And some of that was nice. Mm. Uh, uh, and I've learnt more about others and about God's word mm. and grace. And Would you have done anything differently in those years? Uh, yeah, I lost so many <laughs> things. Uh, but the number of things that follow out of this, uh, one is that I would have spent more time in prayer. Mm. This is one of the, and I think I really think this is one of your legacies among, for many of us is that, um, you know, for those depending on when you're watching this, the these these uh, controversies and debates continue in our own circles, and so there's a whole another generation of us who are um, involved now. Um, but one thing that I have noticed from many of us who have been taught by you is that there is an emphasis I think more on prayer and in the lead up to some of these things on okay sure we have to prepare certain papers we yes. have to do certain yes. things but actually um, you know there was one suggestion from a colleague pastor leading up to our last synod where these these debates were again on the table how about everyone just commit to, to praying the litany once a day in preparation for our church and yes. I think that's uh, the, the fact that um, we some people even are at that point um, is is quite a miraculous thing from the journey you've described yeah. about church and it's and where our confidence often is. Yeah. Uh, I'd say some encouraging signs of renewed emphasis on these things among certain groups of people. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I mean, you need to realise that basically um, at the time when I graduated from seminary, um, uh, there was very little praying mm. going on, and most of my contemporaries. Uh, found it difficult to see any significance in prayer. Now they'd say prayer is not a sacrament and that's the end of the story. Uh, 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 we weren't taught about prayer, either biblically or practically, and we were convinced about the importance of it. Now preaching was important, yes, that was important. Um, uh, social action, all those kinds of things important, but not prayer. And what's interesting is that uh, how uh, the Lutheran Church here in Australia has become gr gradually a praying church. Mm. And that's right across the spectrum. No, it's, you, you can't say it's just no, no. one. Mm. It's, yeah. it's, uh, uh, we've been humbled and brought to our knees. And uh, that's the best thing that I've seen happen in my lifetime. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, but what would have I done differently? Spent more time in prayer practicing what I teach. <laughs> uh, uh, secondly, um, you know, because of the uh, enormous demands made on me, both when I was uh, uh, working in high school and in seminary until retirement, um, uh, I would have liked to have spent more time with Claire, my wife, and children and grandchildren. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they've had to suffer yeah. uh, because of my obsession. <laughs> uh, I, I heard someone saying on the, the other day, you know, you, you, you never meet anyone in their retirement, in their old age, saying, I just should have spent more hours at the office. Yes. You know? no. That's my big regret. That's, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and then there's a third part, which is that I regret that I haven't been a better listener. Uh, more attentive, more charitable, um, uh, because of uh, I'm a passionate person, and that means that I tend to be assertive and jump in, and I can't wait. I'm impatient. I'm assertive, and I, looking back, I can see that I've done my cause no good, and myself no good and the cause of Christ no good by being too assertive and jumping in too quickly uh, instead of holding back, holding my tongue, uh, listening more and listening in a much more charitable way. Uh, 
uh, it's that passionate assertiveness, and particularly with with passion, because once emotion comes in to the play, uh, people uh, feel attacked yeah. and manipulated. And um, you know, one of the things I repent of is the people that I've damaged with my emotional assertiveness. Um, and in ret in retirement, you're spending more time with the with Claire and the grandkids now, and what sort of thing? Yes, like today, we had one grandchild around here, and then two more are here this evening, mm. uh, hovering around. Here, someone, someone around yes, out there. Yeah. Had a bit of a peek, and you people mm. can't see them, but mm. they're around. Uh, yes, and uh, that's a great joy uh, mm. to have time for that, uh, even if I haven't had the same energy anymore. Mm. Uh, but to spend so much time with Claire, mm. you know, we're, we're, um, I'm at home and we're together uh, probably too much for each other. <laughs> uh, but she's my best friend and soulmate and she's been my mainstay uh, all four years and I just enjoy being with her. Uh, and uh, it's one of the best things about retirement is having time for that. And so perhaps, perhaps the final question then, John, as we um, tie it all together, you've, you've no doubt touched on, um, on the answer to this in various ways already, but what are you most thankful for as you reflect back on your life and your spiritual journey? Uh, yeah, first generally, one of my favourite Bible passages comes from 1 Timothy 6. Um, uh, verse 17, I think, is where Paul says God provides or gives us all things richly for our enjoyment. Uh, just uh, how at every stage of my life, God has given me so much for my enjoyment. And paradoxically, even and especially in the darkest times. Uh, that's when... Uh, uh, discovered uh, some of the greatest joys. Hmm. So all things for enjoyment, um, uh, and being then the, as being thankful in all circumstances, not just the good ones but the bad ones. Then um, obviously, uh, not so obviously, I Claire's. Uh, I'm just I can't imagine my life or my ministry without Claire, and I couldn't have accomplished any of it without her active support and encouragement mm. um, but m more if I, as I in thinking about this the thing that I am uh, most thankful for in my work as a pastor is people just all the thousands of people that God has placed in my life and that's the good thing if I think you know what's good about being a pastor from a human point of view if I was just an ordinary job, I would uh, share in the life of my wife, my family, one or two friends. But as a pastor, I've shared in the lives of so many people at the most significant parts of their lives mm. and giving window and being with them and had this tie, this link with thousands of people. Um, Many of whom, you know, most of whom I haven't been able to keep contact with. And one of the, the uh, things I'm looking forward to is renewing acquaintance eventually mm. Mm. and to see uh, where they've gone. But, but just thankful for people. People are fascinating. People are wonderful. They're terrible. They're troublesome. And they're a pain in the proverbial when you're in parish. And yet, greatest joy. Such a privilege. Such mm. a privilege. Mm. And people are so wonderful. Mm. Uh, but probably most significantly and spiritually, if going beyond the normal things, is the gift of a good conscience. Uh, that is the greatest treasure that we as Christians enjoy. And I only realise at this stage of my life how rare it is and how few people have a good, clear conscience. Uh, who can say with Paul, uh, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Uh, to live with a good conscience and uh, how that 
then enriches everything in life and gives you a foretaste of heaven. Um, so the gift of a good conscience is uh, uh, the best gift that God's given to me. My favourite Bible passage is from John 5, 24, where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. That hearing the word, having eternal life now, why to eternal life? Because there's no condemnation. And that means we've already done the great Passover, the crossover. Mm. We already begin to live in faith, our heavenly lives on earth. Mm. We've crossed over from death to life. Uh, and that's the comes as a result of a good conscience. Well, I can't think of a much better place to leave it than that, John. So thank you again for sharing your journey with us all. God bless you. Bless you too. Ah, too much waffle.